What's up you guys, welcome back. So for today's video, I am finally going to be telling you guys about my $30,000 debt. So get comfortable, get some popcorn, grab some coffee, because man, do I have a story to tell you guys today. But before we get started, smash the subscribe button, hit the like button, let's try to get the video to 200 likes, do all that cool YouTube stuff. All right, you guys ready for this? You're not ready for it. <laughs> I'm barely ready for it. Okay, so, a lot of you know that I had to run from charges in New York. I had like three or four felony charges. So it was a uh, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, grand larceny, false written statement, false police report, all that good stuff. Um, because my ex robbed a store, I was innocent of this crime. I did not rob that store. So eventually those charges got dropped, but I was not willing to fight that case because it was a very serious case from the county jail with a public defender. So my addict self back in the day said, you need to run, you need to get out, just go on the run, blah, blah, blah. And my addiction kind of controlled my life. I knew if I go to the county jail, I can't fight my case, but I also know I have to get sober and I was not willing to do that. So I had to run out of my apartment. And by run, I mean like jump out of a second story window into an abandoned building, jump, like <laughs> cut, I cut my arm on glass from the window. It was just crazy, guys. I did anything by any and all means necessary to get out of that situation. I had to get in a cab. I then ran on the cab, didn't pay the cab money, like crazy, right? So eventually that day I got to this, um, this addict's apartment just to like keep it nice. He, he was not a good person, but I knew I was safe there or at least I thought I was. So it's a college town that I'm in. We're playing beer pong, everyone's partying, everything kind of seems chill. And I let my guard down a little bit and I start drinking and I feel like I'm okay. So my dealer had a very large reach in that area. Okay, and the last thing I think is this like rich dealer is gonna come and find me at this, I'm sorry, like crackhead apartment. Like it's a disgusting apartment. I don't mean to offend anyone. Like if you're on crack, like listen, it wasn't, no one smoked crack there. It was like a crack house though. Like that's what it looked like. Just janky, nasty, dirty place. Uh, not my best moment. And I am, like I said, partying with them, letting my guard down, and we hear a knock on the door, but it's not like a cop, so I kind of feel okay, like it didn't even really get my attention, it's just like a little knock. And the person that um, had the apartment, it was his apartment, he opened the door and bam, my dealer's there. Now my dealer is 6'2", big guy, I'm like 110 pounds, tiny little white girl, and he is just huge, right? He towered over me. I'm like 5'4", he's like 6'2". I see him and immediately like my heart goes in my stomach. Now all I want to do is run, you know? He walks in and he said, let's go, like talking to me and I'm like, no. And he's like, I said, let's go, get in the car. And I'm just like, uh, no, I'm not doing it. And this kind of goes back and forth for a little while. And you know in the movies, you guys, where like the music stops, like people will drop their cups, like they're paying attention. Like that's kind of how it felt. Like it was tense. I could just feel the energy. I could like cut the tension with a knife in the room. It just did not feel good. And everyone was like looking at the floor. So I just kind of got my lady balls and said, um, go F yourself. Now, keep in mind, this is someone I owe $30,000 to. This is someone that is not playing games. This is someone that wants me to get in his car now. For some reason, I thought, they're gonna help me. Like, there's, there's people here, you can't just snatch me up, blah, blah, blah. I was very wrong, very, very wrong. So I said that, I'm like, go F yourself. I look around for a second, no one's even looking at us, they're all looking at the ground. No one cares, and I'm like, no one's gonna back me up. Like, my, my friends, like, none of you care, none of you are gonna help me, really, really. So then I just kind of swallowed my, my fear, and I just said, all right, I used the P word, <laughs> fine, I'll go. Everyone's gotta be, insert inappropriate word that starts with a P there. And I got in the car and I just thought, he's gonna kill you. Like, what are you even thinking? What are you even doing? And we get in his car, very nice, very fancy car, and he uh, doesn't say a word to me. Now we're driving around and I don't even know where we are. We're in like back, back woods. And this is like every bad dream. Like we're driving on roads, I don't know. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I have no phone, I have no money, I have no nothing. I can't just jump out because I'll be in the woods. Like, where are we? This guy's gonna kill me. I've seen every mob movie. I've seen every horror movie. Like we're in the woods. He's gonna shoot me in the head and bury me. Like that's literally what I thought. But then we like pop up at this little like gas station. This gas station is kind of in the middle of nowhere, you guys. And um, he said, the first thing he said to me was, stay in the car. Now I've seen crime shows. 
I'm not staying in the car because my addict self says, just go in the gas station so they see you on video surveillance and at least they'll get caught for your murder. <laughs> Most people would run from that situation because it's scary, I'm alone, I know he has a gun, like I know he could kill me at any moment, I owe $30,000, this is very serious. But my brain says in that moment, just go in the gas station and get a Gatorade so that you're on the surveillance cameras. And I do that. And he sees me walk in, he's so mad. And without saying anything to each other, he basically like is like, mm, I can't believe you got in the car. And I was like, ha, what are you gonna do now? Like I, we were talking but not saying anything. It was just like that awkward like, like, I can't even explain it, you guys. It was just like, he was like staring me down. And I was like, what, what are you gonna do? Nothing, let me get my Gatorade. And I go up to the counter, I put it down, like expecting him to pay for it, I don't have any money. I put it down and I just stand there and he just glares at me. He is so mad, he is so mad. So we get back in the car and he's like, um, heard you got a bus ticket, heard you were gonna leave. And I'm like, no. <laughs> He knows everything, but I, I had planned to run, right? So I did have a bus ticket and he said, um, so, so you don't have a bus ticket? I just said no and I looked out the window. Now, this was like the most tense, awkward situation. I don't even know what to say. I don't know if running is a good idea. I don't know if, I, if telling him I wanna leave is a good idea because I owe this money, but I've also created a lot of hate. So back in the day when I first started doing business with him, in the day two years prior we were drinking crystal ce celebrating um new year's he would give me weed in like these beautiful glass jars it was just we had tons of money it was like a big deal we went from that to me being broke wearing pajama pants like those uh like plaid pajama pants in his chrysler 300 as we're driving around on back roads and he's deciding whether or not to kill me over 30 grand right like i know that's what's going on so he said, look, I know you have a bus ticket. I'll make you a deal. You leave and you never come back. We'll call it good. No way is he gonna let me off that easy, you guys. So I'm like, great, so let me out of the car. And he pulls up to this Crack Shack Hotel, nasty, nasty place, janky place, right? Like that's how I, use, that's what I say to describe nastiness. And he said, uh, I'll let you go, but I'm gonna babysit you until then because he didn't want me talking to law enforcement. He didn't want me like having any, any interaction with anyone, period. Now, I don't have any dope, but he does. And by dope, I mean heroin. I know he does, but I just have to like pace in this tiny little room. There's two beds. We're not gonna sleep. He, like, I know he's not gonna sleep because if he sleeps and I sneak out, that's on him, right? Like, so he has to babysit me, he has to watch me. I'm pacing back and forth, smoking cigarettes, like, I'm just, I'm anxious, withdrawals are starting to kick in, all I wanna do is get high, I feel like already like I'm sweating, I'm in pain, that's like the early signs of withdrawal and I just need something, but I'm not gonna tell him I need something because I still had a little bit of pride. The next morning finally rolls around after the longest night of my life, like I'd rather go to jail <laughs> than be with him, right? Um, he drives to this little bus depot in the middle of nowhere and he asks the bus schedule, walks inside, stay in the car, walks inside, asks for the bus schedule and all of that. And um, he used to always keep money in his glove, not his glove box, in the center console, just envelopes of hundreds. So I see him walking back and forth. I feel like he's just trying to intimidate me at this point. And without moving, I lift up the glove or the center console. I lift it up and I see there's money there. Now, if I move all around, I'm looking for stuff. He's going to see that and come out and get me. So without moving, I like open it really slowly and I reach in. I grab a dollar, look at it, I'm like, oh, it's 100, thank God. I do it again. I got $300 before he comes out and I have to close the thing. Now I'm just hoping he doesn't open it because I don't know if I've moved anything. I don't know if he knew how much was there. Like, I had no idea. He said, all right, you can go. And I just thought, really? Like, you're, you're gonna just let me go? So I go to get out of the car, I open the door, I'm halfway out. He grabs my arm and I just thought, I knew it. I knew it, he is going to kill me. He grabs my arm like hard too, like not like lightly. He grabs my arm hard and I just kind of stopped and he said, don't you need this? Opens his hand, it's like 10 grams of heroin. And I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. I have a disease that doesn't give me the, uh, <laughs> doesn't give me the luxury of having pride. And I did not want to take that from him. My addiction told me I had to, but it just was like the lowest of the low. Like, how do we even get here? How do we, how was it, how did it go from that to where I am right now? Like, this is just horrible. I felt like a POS, you guys, like it was not good. I take a deep breath and I look at it and I grab it from him and I said, thanks and got out. Now, all of my possessions have been whittled down 
from custom made shoes to everything in Sephora. Like I had all this fancy stuff. It, my possessions have been whittled down so much that I had a backpack with a couple of outfits, a picture of my ex-boyfriend, a needle and a pair of socks. That's all I had. It's all I had. And because I had to now take a bus ride that was gonna be like, like 15 hour long bus ride, that backpack, all my possessions also doubled as a pillow on a Greyhound bus and that's it. That's where my addiction had taken me. Now, I'm holding this bag um, of stuff <laughs> in my hand and I'm just like, like on the bus, there's people. I take, like I walk in, I take my seat and I'm holding it in my hand. It's like the most prized possession I own because it's gonna keep me from not being sick. And I, in my mind, I'm like, oh, just space it out and you can, um, you can taper down. You can take your addiction and just, you'll be okay. Yeah, it'll hurt, yeah, it'll suck, but if you do it correctly, you can taper down. But like I said, my addiction will not give me the luxury of spacing out my stuff. So I did all of that by the time I made it to my destination. So I went from New York to Virginia and by the time I got to Virginia, I had nothing because that's how my addiction worked. But the one thing I had was that my dude told me I could just walk on a $30,000 debt that I had been wanting to kill myself for in the past because I knew I was never gonna make up that money and feed my addiction and feed my boyfriend's addiction and pay all my bills and pay the people that were selling for me. I had this whole thing, you guys, and um, my, <laughs> My debt was not even just with him. It was with everything. I owed on my house. I owed my, you know, I owed my mom's bills, my friend's bills. Like I couldn't help anyone. I was drowning. And um, all of those things, all my responsibilities is why I justified living that life. Like I have to pay my bills. I have to help my mom. I have to help this person, help that person, feed my addiction, feed my boyfriend's addiction. And it, it is what made me become that person. And after that, I detoxed but it wasn't enough. I still had another one in me and I went out for 10 more months before I got sober. So I'm gonna end this video here and I just want you all to know if you're struggling in addiction and you're want, you wanna get out, please fight for that sobriety. Nothing is better than being sober. Yeah, it hurts, but that pain is temporary and living a sober life is possible and it's beautiful. I love you guys and I will see you next time.